Good morning, Ridgefield Church Online. I am so glad that you're joining with us this morning. And so whether you are on vacation and missing Sunday morning with your church family, or maybe you are just taking some time to worship from home today, whatever the reason that you are not with us live in person this morning, we welcome you. My name is Miranda and I'm the pastor of care ministry here at Ridgefield Nazarene. And I'm so thrilled that you are joining with us. If you would like to stay in contact with us, you can use our text line, which is 360-552-7794. And this is a really great way for us to be able to stay connected with you. You can get more information on any events that we have coming up. You can send in prayer requests as they come to you. And you can also just ask general questions if you've got anything going on in your life and need support in any way. It's a great number to be able to have. Well, as we start worshiping together this morning, I'm gonna invite you to stand. And I know standing in your house can feel a little bit weird, but there's something really amazing that happens when we stand and give some dedicated time to worshiping Jesus. And so this morning, I am inviting you to stand with us, your entire church family, and worship one God together in unity. I can't wait for you to experience all that today has, and I can't wait to hear about your online experience later this week. All right, join with us as we enter into a time of worship. We are so glad to have you here this morning, everyone that's here. And if you are new here, we are especially glad to have you here. It's one of our favorite things to meet new people and to have you join us. Um, and if you are new here, we want to let you know that we have a text line that is welcome. Everybody is welcome to use it. And um, it's a phone number that you can put in your phone and save it. And it is 360-552-7794. Um, I think the phone number is not on my thing, so I'm hoping I'm remembering that correctly. Anyway, um, so you can use that phone number to text us, if you're new here, to text us the word guest, and it will let us know that you're here. And then Miranda, who is our Connections pastor, she will um, get in touch with you. We also have a gift for you out in the um, lobby that next to the sign that says new here, so at the Connection Center. Everyone else, you can use that phone number for all kinds of things. If you need a registration event link, if you have a question, if you have a prayer request, whatever it is, we, we want you to have that phone number saved in your phone and to use it. Um, and as a pastor's wife, I'm very thankful for that number because then everybody's not texting my husband directly. So that's always good. Uh, Coming up this Friday, Compassion 360 is having one of their closet share events. And so this week they will set up the gym and it will be full of tables, full of clothes that are free to anyone who might be able to use them. And so um, we would love for you all to come and to spread the word. Um, it is this Friday from 5 to 8 in the gym. Uh, and we have it out on social media, and so we'd love it, if you, especially if you live in some smaller communities around here, if you would share it to your community pages. It's on the Compassion 360 Facebook page, and um, I work in La Center, and I realize how uh, limited some of the resources are to some of the communities around us, and so share that information. Get it out there. There are kids and families that could use that information, so be sure to share it. Also, this weekend, I learned that they're going to have some formal attire. So for kids who um, are going to want to go to prom and dress up for that kind of event, they're going to be sharing different prom dresses. And I know I've seen people donating them and stuff. And so um, be sure to spread the word. And if you have a friend that can use it, tell them and tell them you'll stand in line with them. It'd be, it'd be really awesome. Um, also, we want you to know that last week we had our board elections and... There was a hiccup with that process. And so um, because of just wanting to do things correctly and not wanting to just, you know, 
to, we just want to want to be on the up and up. Um, we're going to redo those church elections in two weeks. So next Sunday on March 17th, we're going to have ballots out again and redo the church board elections. There was a typo on the on the ballot, and we just and the elections were super close, and so we just want to make sure we're we're doing everything on the up and up. And so next not next Sunday, two weeks from today on the 17th, we're going to redo um, our church board elections and there will be ballots available for that. If you want to give back to God and um, through giving, you can do that in several different ways. We have boxes next to each of our doors if you want to give something in person or you can text us the word give or, to go, or go to ridgenaz.org slash give and find the link there to give. With open ears, open minds, open hearts, would you teach us today from your good word, we ask. In your name, amen. All right, grab a seat. So last week we talked a little bit, um, kind of asked the question, what is my place in this world? And uh, this week we're going to kind of ask the question as we, again, read, reading through the, the next section in the book of Colossians, what is my purpose? What is my mission? A um, couple of, I mean, these are some of the questions that we're regularly asking ourselves. And in these weeks when we're reading through the book of Colossians, this letter, the ancient letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a group of Jesus followers in the ancient city of Colossae. Uh, he is, he, he, he's addressing these questions, but maybe not in the way we would like him to, right? Because when we think of like, what is my mission? What is my purpose? We want to know what should I be doing? What should I wake up and do tomorrow to live out my mission and purpose so that I will feel fulfilled? Because part of the, part of the challenge that we face is we fill up our lives with a lot of commitments, a lot of activities, a lot of things that we do, a lot of things that we buy, trying to find some fulfillment, some satisfaction, trying to make the most out of life. I want to know what my mission is. What should I be doing? But here's what we get, here's what we discover. Answering that question is a lot harder than we realize. So we offer the, uh, the unique course, and we are right in the middle of it. How many weeks do we have left, Deb? Uh, the teaching's over right at spring break, please. Okay, right at spring break. Okay, so, uh, so four weeks left or so, right? And a couple of weeks ago, at the midpoint, um, we invited everybody who had come back because at the midpoint is when the, the folks that are working through the class stand up and say, um, from what I've been learning and praying and learning about myself and the exercises we've been going through, I am serving God and loving, I'm, I'm honoring Honoring God and serving people best when I am, and they fill in the blanks with two words. And this is one of my favorite times because this is now what the third or fourth time we've kind of gone through it. In fact, in fact, just a couple weeks ago, we had our 40th person stand up and say, "This is what when I am when I, I am honoring God and serving people best when I am." And these are powerful moments. But they come, yeah, it's a, it's a celebration. And to see 40 people, it's, it's pretty fun, pretty amazing. But here's, here's what we've discovered, that it takes a lot of work to get there. In fact, Javier, he, he, was, he was one of my favorites. So in this class, um, he's brand new to staff. And so we were like, okay, work, we want you to take the unique course. And so you can be, be right on track with us and know the language of it. And uh, so he got up and he shared. And he had his iPad and he showed us a picture of something we weren't really sure what it was. But he described it as, I can't remember the name in Spanish, but it's basically a prickly pear. And he said, you know what, we have a, we have a saying in um, Hispanic culture when something is really, really hard. And uh, he said, this process of understanding as a pastor, right, and like someone who has a very clear understanding of like, like their own mission and they get to live it out in their day job, right? But he said, getting this down to two words precisely to state my mission has been so hard. It's been a lot of work. We have a saying for it that it's as hard as giving birth to a prickly pear. Which, you know, don't, don't like, I, I know, you're like, a guy saying that, it sounds like a bit of mansplaining, but um, so just, just go with him, let, it, let him have the phrase though, right? It's just like, that's how much work it is. Really to be able to say, this is my sense of mission and purpose. And part of where we get a little bit off is we always want to know what we should be doing. But here's what I've discovered, here's what I've discovered. Before we can answer the question, what should I be doing? 
Well, like Simon Sinek said in his famous TED Talk, what is your why? Like before you answer the what should I be doing, you got to know what is your why, like why you're doing it. And then what we discover here, the even more important question is not just why are you doing it, but who? That the who question, for whom and to whom? The who question is way more important. And so if you want to know what your mission, your purpose is, you can get there. It's going to be a lot of work. You've got to answer some of the most important questions. And I think that's what, when we're reading, especially what we're going to read today, we begin to answer some of those more important questions, some of the who questions. So that's where we're going today. So we're going to pick up in um, Colossians chapter 1, um, starting in verse 24. You can follow along in your Bibles there in the seat backs or your electronic Bible, your own Bible if you brought it, or as uh, often, we're going to throw it up on the screen here. Let me just read through the whole uh, text that we're going to talk through today, and then I'll, um, and then we'll, and then we'll, uh, and then we'll kind of walk through it. So uh, Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 24. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people." To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy of Christ, all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not yet met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this, so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in the body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Ah, God's word. It's good. It's rich. We're so thankful for it. It's complex, isn't it? Some of you are like, what did we just read? There's a lot there. Well, I'm glad you asked um, because we're going to kind of unpack a little bit of it today. So let's go all the way back to the beginning here. And there's an interesting part that he says in verse 24 that, if, that initially might kind of get us off track. I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Okay, so it sounds as if Jesus' suffering wasn't enough. Like he didn't suffer enough because something is still lacking in the suffering. And Paul has kind of a savior complex here. Like he has to make up for what Jesus didn't do enough of as if Jesus didn't suffer enough. Like I watched the passion of the Christ. Bro suffered enough. Whew. Okay, That's, that, was, I, that wasn't all that funny. It, I, you're right. Why did he even try? So And if you're not sure how much Jesus suffered, like pick random Jesus movie around Easter and watch it, right? And you will be reminded of the terrible suffering of Jesus. So so is Paul saying here that Jesus didn't suffer enough, something was lacking, but that doesn't even make sense theologically because we believe that the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus was sufficient. It was enough once and for all. No more sacrifices ever need to happen because what Jesus did on the cross was enough fully. And finally, why is Paul saying that 
He has to somehow fill up in his flesh what is still lacking in Christ's afflictions and Christ's sufferings. And here's the, here's the, here's the key to it. It's his reference to where he says, for the sake of his body, which is the church. So Jesus suffered enough for us. His death on the cross was fully sufficient to forgive all of our sins and to make all of us right with God. In his human body, physical body on earth, Paul likes to kind of play with some of the metaphors here. And so he says, now let's think of his body, the body of Christ. So, so, so here's how, how the metaphor goes, right? That when you're a follower of Jesus, you become a part of the body of Christ of which Jesus is the head. So let's, let's illustrate it like this, okay? Um, all right, so Jesus reaches out and he says, hey, Tom, follow me. And Tom says, gladly, Jesus, I'll follow you, okay? All right? And then hang on. Hey, don't, don't let go of Jesus, okay? I'm just pretending to be Jesus, right? So just, just we're going to we'll play a lot. Oh. oh, Jesus loves you so much, brother. And then Jesus says, Kelly, follow me. And Kelly says, gladly, Jesus. Okay. And, okay, now, look, in some way, Kelly is now connected to Tom, right? Because Kelly's connected to Jesus, Tom's connected to Jesus, and they're connected to each other. What if they don't like each other? I like Kelly. I, I know. You were sitting next to him in church. I know, but we'll, we'll, we'll just go with it. You know, I, I thought about looking around to be like, well, what we could make, yeah, whatever. You know, you, you like each other already. What if, what if, what if, uh, what if one of them was a Chiefs fan and one of them was a 49ers fan, right? And you're like, Jesus, you need to choose. And he's like, I don't care about dumb stuff like that, but whatever. What if... Uh, what if one of them votes red and the other votes blue? Ooh. We're, st we're still hanging on to Christ, right? We're, we're related. We're connected. Okay, now here's what's really cool about Jesus. He's like, it's best for you that I go back up into heaven and send my Holy Spirit. Why? Because as long as Jesus is on earth, his physical body has two hands. Holy Spirit comes and he has like unlimited number of hands. And the Holy Spirit of Jesus holds out the hand of Jesus to every single person on the face of the earth. And those unlimited number of hands, a whole bunch of them don't have another hand on the other side holding on. And there's a whole bunch of people, thank you guys, there's a whole bunch of people in our world who have not yet taken the hand of Jesus to be connected to his body of which Jesus is the head. And so Paul says, I am willing to suffer. I am willing to go, to be hungry, to, to, to take dangerous journeys on dangerous roads. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I am willing to suffer. I will suffer gladly to fill up Christ's body with as many people as possible. To make the introduction to as many people as possible so that they too may take the hand of Jesus. Now that's a, that's a sense of mission, right? And so he describes it here. I have become its servant. I have become a servant of the body of Christ worldwide, globally. I've become a servant I have become its servant by the commission that God gave me to do what? To present to you all the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for all ages and generations, but is now disclosed to God's, to, to the Lord's people. All right, so God gives Paul a mission, and the mission is I want you to reveal to people the great mystery of faith. It's been hidden for all generations, but now it's visible, okay? And, 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 and here it is. Here is the great mystery of faith that is now available. Verse 27, to them, all the Lord's people, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, among non-Jewish people, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of of glory. That's the mystery. Christ in you, 
the hope of glory. Now, if you are thinking to yourself, probably quietly, because you might be afraid to say it out loud in church, like, that's the mystery? Seems a bit underwhelming. Maybe there's something to it that I don't understand or realize, because why, 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 why is that such a mystery, and why is it so great and wonderful, and why would someone gladly suffer for, for that mystery? I thought we all kind of knew that. Well, we kind of know that because we're 2,000 years on this side of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, being Christ in us, the hope of glory. Let's just go back in time a little bit. Paul's original um, audience here, they are living in the Roman city of Colossae in which there has been Greek influence, Roman influence. And when we think about the religious options that were available to them, they basically had three options. Let's go ahead and throw that up on the screen here. So the first option that they had would have been on the left-hand side is what we might kind of just call general Greek and Roman mythology and the, the, the stories of the gods and goddesses who control the forces of nature, right? And then this is just, we could also call it like pagan religion. We could call it natural religion. Like um, uh, um, anthropologists, when they study cultures, they just recognize that one common thing in every culture all around the world is some kind of religion, some kind of like belief in gods, goddesses, forces, something that's bigger and how you should respond to them. And most commonly, this is what it looks like. We need to feed ourselves, we need to raise our food, but the forces of nature seem to be working against us. Like, why is it snowing on on March 1st when it's supposed to be sunny outside, right? Who's trying to freeze us to death? The snow god is out there trying to... Nobody thought that this morning? What are you, crazy? (laughs) I'm the only one. Okay, Samantha did. Thank you, thank you. There was someone else wondering what is going on, right? Now, we're not going to necessarily call that the snow god is angry or like the ice queen is like doing the whole, you know, frozen thing, but... But that might be what naturally comes to mind. There are gods and goddesses who control the forces of nature. And if you don't keep them happy, the sun doesn't shine, the rain doesn't fall, we go hungry. We starve to death. So keep the gods happy. That's the essence of naturalistic kind of nature, religion, and and mythology kind of tells some of the stories of the gods and goddesses that control the forces of nature. And so what do you do? You live in fear and you're afraid of these gods and so you offer whatever sacrifices you're convinced they want to keep them happy, appease the gods. And so Paul says, this is the great mystery. It's such a mystery because for thousands of years, people have been appeasing the gods, trying to make them happy, living in fear, afraid of the gods. But the mystery of Jesus that has now been revealed is God. God doesn't enjoy punishing us. God loves us so much that he sent his son. And Jesus Christ, the son of God, we talked about that last week, willingly became a human to show us his plan and to show us that God is actually for us, not against us. And so Jesus Christ, the son of God, died for us. And we don't have to live and be afraid of God, always trying to appease God or gods, that that we can live in relationship with God who loves us, cares for us. Does he hate sin? Yes, he hates sin, but he hates it so much and he loves you so much that instead of making you pay the penalty for it, he paid the penalty himself. That's hope. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, there were some folks who had kind of outgrown in Greek culture, had kind of outgrown the old mythology and kind of gotten tired of the whole kind of sacrificial system and temples and always living afraid. They were like, I want to live on a higher plane. And so, so Greek philosophers came along, and especially by the time of Paul, in, a, in, a, in an area like Colossae and Laodicea, there would have been the Greek philosophers who were saying, you know what, let's put our minds, rather than being living in fear and always appeasing the gods, let's think and let's learn wisdom. And as we learn wisdom, let's give ourselves to developing the virtues of a virtuous life and live in wisdom. Let's live with the virtue of courage over cowardice. Let's live with the virtue of patience over losing our cool and lashing out in anger. Let's let's live with the virtue of temperance. Not letting our internal passions control us, but temperance, self-control. Here's what they discovered. We just can't do it. 
no matter how hard you try to live all the virtues and to live a virtuous life just like you should, you just can't do it. We're just never good enough on our own. We can't even measure up to our own standards of goodness. And Christ in you is the hope of glory because Christ in you empowers you. Christ in you, the Holy Spirit of Jesus in you and I, empowers us and gives us the ability to live with self-control. Gives us the ability. The only reason I am able to say and do things with courage instead of cowardice is by the power of Christ in me. The only way I'm able to not lose my temper is the power of Christ in me. He says that's the great mystery that comes through Christ. The third option that would have been available is the Jewish faith, Judaism. By this time, Judaism did not look like primarily go to the temple and offer sacrifices because they lived a long way from the temple. It was read and study. Maybe once or twice in a lifetime, you might be able to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and offer sacrifice at the temple. But, but here's, the, here's, the, here's what it looks like day after day after day. Read your Old Testament, study the Old Testament, learn the laws, memorize the laws. And remember that not only were there the 690 laws explicitly given in the Old Testament, there were all of the rabbis that came after that that gave additional rules and traditions to help you follow the laws. And so if there's six to 700 laws and five traditions to help you apply every one of those, now we have thousands of rules and traditions that you have to follow. And by the time Jesus comes along, the Jewish faith feels like a religion of heavy obligation. All these rules that you need to follow, and it was exhausting. It was like live out of deep obligation to God. Not a lot of gratitude. They tried to, be, to, to have a lot of gratitude, but it just didn't work out like that. Which also then led to pride. Which also led to kind of keeping people out. And there were us and them, Jews and Gentiles. The word Gentile literally means the rest of the world. And my young men's small group a couple weeks ago, we were talking about like this, this, like why did they not share God's law, which was supposed to be good? Why did they not share it with other people? And I think it was because it was such an obligation and the weight and the burden was so heavy that they're like, why share this with somebody else and put this burden on their shoulders? But then it kind of became a place of pride of like, look how good we are that we're somehow able to obey all these rules and you ungodly people aren't. And it was us and them and we're better than you. Because that's kind of what you do when you just like circle the wagons and keep everybody else's. You find your meaning with your kind of social cultural pride. And Paul comes along and he says, the mystery is this, Christ in you. That Jesus fulfilled that Old Testament law perfectly. And so you also don't have to strive and worry and fear that you're not obeying it enough perfectly. And rather than giving your attention to the perfect adherence to laws and traditions, give your attention to Jesus Christ who lives in you. He is your hope and he is your glory. And by the way, Kick that pride to the curb because everybody can come to Jesus. Jews and Gentiles. And there's no more us and them. Everybody takes the hand of Jesus. And when you take the hand of Jesus, we're all equal in front of Jesus. No Jew, no Gentile. That's good news. That is hope of glory. That is a mystery that those first century Christians who were all Jewish for a long time had to wrap their heads around. This is new truth that we've never imagined before and it's great and it's wonderful. And Paul says, I am going to give my life to this. Continue on verse 28. He, Jesus, is the one we proclaim admonishing, teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we can present everyone fully mature in Christ. So he says, guys, I dream of the day when you stand before Jesus without fear, without shame, but confident because of who Christ is in you, fully mature in Christ. 
To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy that Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea, the next town over, and for all the people who have not yet met me personally. He says, I want as many people as possible to be free from whatever old system of getting to God that they've been living under and be free to follow Jesus, receive Jesus, to have Christ in them, their hope of all glory and goodness and wonderful because it's all about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Christ in you. That's the good news. Verse 2, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart. I'm going to change this up a little bit, though, because we have a little too much them language. I'm going to make it personal, you. So when we read this, I want you to hear this for yourself, just like Apostle Paul says, this is what he wants for them. This is what I want for you. This is what God wants for you. This is what Christ in you can look like, can mean. So, so let's, let's just look back. I'm just going to read it right off the screen. My goal is that you may be encouraged in heart that you would be united in love. In, in this section, I'm just going to intentionally kind of slow it down so that we can, we can kind of feel some of these things, okay? I, I don't just want us to learn about Scripture. I want us to hear and feel it. Which, or these next couple of verses, I want you just to sense, like, which of these phrases really... You just hear them differently because the Holy Spirit really wants you to hear this phrase of what he wants for you. My goal is that you may be encouraged in heart. Come on, some of you need to be encouraged in heart today. Here in a little while, I'm I'm really watching the clock today and here's why. I'm going to be done preaching at 10 a.m. so that we have a full 10 minutes before we're ready to go so that we can pray and talk to God. Our prayer team's going to be here. And I don't want us to like, you know, kind of recently we've been doing this thing where we have these prayer team members and I don't know if I should go up and be prayed for. Is it embarrassing? Is it whatever? You know what? Can we just be real and honest before God that it's way better? If there's anything you're you're carrying, anything you want from God, it's so much better to pray with somebody else. And let's just like throw away our pride and be humble and say we all need Jesus far more than we realize. So so I'm just going to just... I'm just going to read some of these and let it set in. So just hear how, see what you're hearing, what you're sensing, even kind of how your body's responding to some of this truth. My goal is that you may be encouraged in heart, that you may be united in love. Come on, we got some husbands and wives today who need to be united in love so that you may have the full riches of complete understanding. Let's go to the next slide there. In order that you may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. That's someone here in the room today. Maybe someone watching online. You're like, yeah, that's what I I need to know. The mystery of God, who is Christ. Christ. No more generic God. It's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, my hope and glory. Verse 3, Jesus Christ. Next slide. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Oh, God, I need your wisdom. God, teach me what is true, eternally everlasting. God, teach me your knowledge. I tell you this, verse 4, so that no one may deceive you by their fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and I delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Yeah, Yeah, this is all a big deal for us to be reminded of, because you know what? Maybe we don't Maybe we don't have a history in mythology and offering sacrifices to gods and goddesses. And maybe we don't have a history of 
seeking goodness and virtue through philosophy and wisdom. Maybe we wouldn't have a history of obligation through the Jewish faith, but the messaging is still the same. Obey the rules, obey the rules, obey the rules. You better be good enough and measure up. And even when you're following Christ, folks will come along and say, you're supposed to be doing it this way. You're not doing it this way. You're supposed to be. This is the way we read the Bible and you should. He says, no, no, no. Stand firm in Christ. How about the messaging that says the American dream is about success and arriving and making it. And there's a There's an application and there's an opening for advancement and a promotion. And you should. Everybody wants to be promoted, right? Then you can get more, have more. People look at you more and more and more. And you're going to pay a price for that. And you know what? It's not a sin to turn down promotions. If Jesus says, take the promotion and make the most of it, then take the promotion and make the most of it. But if the promotion and the advancement is only so that you can kind of live a kind of a dream that somebody else has told you you should be living... That is a fine-sounding argument that can lead you away from staying faithful to Christ who says, in me you are enough, you have enough, you do enough. How about the pressure we put on our kids to perform at a high level? And what they learn is obligation, pressure, obligation, pressure, Earn it, prove it. And they don't experience the gospel in us and through us and from us. And so he says, stand firm, verse 6. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and because it's not about obligation and fear, overflowing with thanks, with thankfulness. Are you hearing and sensing? Some phrases, some verses, some words that I believe the Holy Spirit is putting on our hearts and minds, what he wants for us today. Here's what I really want us to focus on today and we're going to spend the last eight minutes on. Back to verse 28. He, Jesus, Christ in you, the hope of glory, he's the one we proclaim. Admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully in Christ. There are some people in our lives who've lost their way. Who aren't living with the hope of Christ in them. They're still living with fear, with obligation, trying to be the wisest, best, most virtuous person they can on their own. And our heart breaks for them. We want them to know Christ Look at how the Apostle Paul describes his own, his, own, uh, his own kind of approach. To this end, verse 29, to this end, I strenuously contend with all of the energy that Christ so powerfully works in me. Even here, he's like, not on my own energy, not by my own abilities. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not even met me personally. He uses that word contend twice. Contend, it's, 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 it's kind of like a fight, but not in a violent kind of way. It, you could also translate it as agonize, but a lot of times we think of being in agony as always a bad thing. It's, so, it's even hard for us to imagine agonizing being kind of a good thing. But here he's like, I'm fighting for you, but it's not a violent kind of a fight. And I love that he's contending for people. You know what's really easy to do is to contend against ideas. And a lot of times, I mean, if you just read what's happening on Facebook and read people's comments on Facebook, we contend against things. We like to contend against ideas and against, against. Paul says, I'm I'm going to put my energy into contending for some people I really care about. 
Even some people I've never met before, which probably means hitting his knees and he's like, God, I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray. God, I pray that your truth would invade their hearts and minds. God, I pray that they'd meet some people who love you and know you. You can set them free from fear, shame, obligation. He's contending, he's contending, he's contending. Here's what I'm asking you today. Who in your life is worth contending for? Remember what we said, purpose and mission in life. We want to ask, what should I be doing? But before you ever ask that, answer that. You've you got to ask, who? For whom Jesus Christ, hope and glory. Now, who are you contending for? Who in your life do you care for so much that you can't stand the idea of them not experiencing the goodness of Jesus, the hope of Jesus? that Christ in them, the hope in glory, could give them so much hope, but they're missing out. And you're just like, and you're contending. But here's what I've discovered, even just kind of recently. Even this week, I was just like listening to a somewhat random podcast. The most recent episode, I'll listen to it. And he's like, He's like, you know, sometimes we church people, we like, we like to talk about like, we need to reach the world of Jesus. We need to reach people for Jesus. And he said, we need to just stop talking about people generally. We need to start talking about the individuals in our lives that we weep over, that our hearts break because we know them and we care for them and we want them and we'll go to the ends of the earth. We will gladly, willingly suffer for them to know Jesus, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ in them. So, who's your one? Someone you care about who's lost their way to come back to Jesus. Someone that you are willing to pray every single day because because that's how much you care. Who's your one? Come on, pray with me. We're not yet ready for the worship team to come back in just a little bit, but just, just this is prayer number one for today, but there's going to be lots in the next several minutes, okay? God, who's my one? God, who's the one that you've placed in my life? God, would you give me a burden that won't end for them to know you and the life and the hope that you hold out to them? God, we dream of them and the day they reach out and take your extended hand and find freedom, forgiveness, fulfillment, hope. God, would you teach us to contend? Okay, you can keep praying, but when you came in this morning, you got to... You got a card, and you're like, what am I going to do with this card? Now you know what you're going to do with this card. If you did not get a card, we have a couple of um, volunteers who are going to stand up, walk around. If you did not get one of these cards, just raise your hand real quick, and we will get you one. There are, uh, there are pens in the seat back, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to write on the top line there the name of your one. Partly because this is so very personal and today's service is being live streamed. I don't want to talk about who my one is, but if you ask me afterwards, I'll tell you. Because I'm in this with you. Write their name down. Okay, now, in this last minute, I'm going to ask you to do something really, really hard, okay? The person whose name you wrote down, are you related to them? My guess is there's a lot of kids who've lost their way, a lot of grandkids who've lost their way, a lot of nieces and nephews who've lost their way, some parents who have lost their way. And your heart's breaking. Here is the hard truth 
that we know. Just like they are not likely to take financial advice from you, they're just as likely to not take spiritual advice from you. And chances are, someone else in their life who's not related to them is more likely to share Jesus with them and them to actually listen. So I'm going to ask you to do something really hard. If you put on that top line the name of someone you're related to, I want you to take the second line and I want you to put the name of someone you're not related to. Someone who doesn't live hours away, but they live close. Someone you regularly see who doesn't know Jesus. Someone who might be someone else's grandson or granddaughter. Someone who might be someone else's father or mother. And you might be the answer to their prayers. So who's the person in your life? you're not related to, that you are also willing to contend for them to know Jesus and his hope, that they would experience Christ in them, their hope for all glory. Come on, church. Yeah, this is risky. Because just like, just like a whole bunch of people rejected Jesus, they might reject you. We've got to decide, is it worth the risk? knowing that the other option might be that they experience Christ in them, the hope of glory. See, now you know why I wanted to have a long time for prayer today. We need it. Whew, this is some heavy stuff we're dealing with, right? So now, band, would you guys come on back? The band's going to start to play. But we're not going to sing for a while because I want us to give us our full attention to prayer and to seeking Jesus. So prayer team members, would you guys come on forward? As they do, I'm going to give you a little bit of vision, okay? Today, four Sundays from today when we gather, we won't have a 9 o'clock service. We won't have a 1030 service because it's Easter, and we're going to change up everything. We're going to add some additional services. We're going to celebrate. It's going to be fun. We're going to celebrate resurrection and new life in Jesus. And I'm envisioning right now, four Sundays from today, a whole bunch of our ones for whom we are contending to be sitting and standing right next to us on Easter, hearing a simple message about how Jesus changes lives, that we are not what we used to be because we met Jesus. And that is hope, and that is good news, and that can be good news for all of us. So who's your one? I'm going to encourage you today, starting today, to pray every day. You can pray for both people on this list. That's why I gave you two lines for your one, because now you know why. And ask God for opportunities to naturally insert Jesus into the conversation. One of the best ways to do that is ask him how you can be praying for them. What's hard in their life that you can be praying for them? You would not believe where those conversations go and the doors open up to have spiritual conversations that are really natural. And you're kind, loving people. You're not pushy, so it's going to be natural. And you're going to go out of your way to be friendly, but not weird friendly, just regular friendly because you're friendly people. And God's going to open the door to invite this person to come worship with you. And in the meantime, we're going to contend, 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 contend. Come on, church, let's stand together. Let's pray. Let's seek God's face. Some of you right now, you need to take your card and find one of these prayer members and stand with them and say, pray with me. Can you just start the prayers together for this person on my list and let's begin contending today and to seek Jesus as they would come to know Jesus. Maybe there's anything else that you are struggling with today. One of these prayer team members is here willing to pray with you. Come on, church. Let's seek Jesus. We've got plenty of time. We've got seven minutes, and you're going to be dismissed at 10 after, I promise. So let's make the most of this time. Jesus, Jesus, we seek you today. Jesus, this is hope, and we've been given a a vision of hope that is you living in us, and that's life transforming. That's so much bigger than we on our own strength and ability can pull off. So Jesus, we need you more than we realize. Come on, church, who's who's the person who's, you're just discouraged today. It's been so long since you've heard and experienced God. You're like, all this sounds good, but I'm just not feeling it. Come on, just be really bold today. And Chelsea, Miranda, Grant, they would love to pray with you that God will be so close to you. Come on, come on forward even now. Let's just pray and let's seek the Lord. 
one of these names, one of these people, you want them to know Jesus. Let Grant, Miranda, Chelsea, let them pray for you today. Come on, church, let's just seek the Lord. Let's pray. seeking Jesus today. I'm going to lead us in a prayer, okay? And if, if one of those names on your list is someone you are related to, come on, let's pray together that God would send the person they will listen to into their lives. Jesus, we pray today for sons and daughters, grandsons, granddaughters, nieces and nephews, moms and dads, grandparents who don't know you yet. And we pray for them. We contend for their souls because we care about them. We love them. So God, we pray today, would you send someone into their lives? Would you send one of your followers whom they will listen to to speak up? And would you give that person boldness and courage and opportunity? And God, we pray for open hearts, open mind, soft hearts, receptive hearts where the cynicism of a sales pitch goes right out the window and they hear your love and your care and your grace that is free and freeing. God, we pray. And if it's not going to be us who gets to have the conversation, then we pray for the person who it is who will experience that harvest of righteousness. And God, we pray for that person that you would raise them up, encourage them, make them bold even now. God, we pray, we pray, we pray. Oh, Jesus, teach us to contend. Come on, church, keep praying. Keep praying. Seek Jesus. Let's sing. This is not the end of the prayer time. We're just, we're just praying a little bit differently. As soon as Grant's available, as soon as Miranda's available, Chelsea's available right now. Somebody wants to come pray with her. Come on, church. Let's just be bold and open. Miranda's available right now. Come on, keep the prayers going, and let's sing our prayers as we prepare to go home. Lead us out of here, guys. What a great service we just had. Again, so grateful that you were able to join us. Remember, if there is anything you need this week, anything at all, please feel free to contact us via text or call at 360-552-7794. Now I hope that you get to go out and live in peace and grace that only Jesus provides. Have a wonderful week and we will see you next time.